So, um, so welcome everyone. I will start by showing the, the, the tech, technical aspects of the system itself that I'm uh, developing since um, end of 2018. Um, the system actually started to be developed since uh, I think 2015 or somewhere. So there are, mm, there is quite a group of people that uh, was developing the system before me and we are all actually uh, within the Comet team kind of collaborating, uh, improving, improving the state. So um, I didn't write the name of all the co-authors, but yeah, it's, it's a group work uh, here. So let's start by um, in a brief introduction to Sentinel-1, which is the satellite system by European Union that we use within the Lixar system. Sentinel-1 offers free and open data and it actually measures the Earth since October 2014. The revisit time of uh, the Sentinel-1 acquisitions are every 12 days or in Europe every six days. This will be even increased when, uh, when another Sentinel-1 satellite will go into constellation soon. The basic ground resolution is, well, let's say, 20 to 5 meters in, uh, in the stand, standard uh, TOPS or IW mode that we, that we use systematically. And yeah, Sentinel-1 is a C-band radar with um, wavelength of around five and a half centimeters. And what is the most important here is uh, this uh, system is capable of interferometry. So again, very briefly, what types of data we can get from Sentinel-1. It's uh, first of all, the intensity of um, radar backscatter. You can see, um, I've, I, I've prepared some, some simple picture, uh, pictures uh, related to an earthquake lately in Mongolia. You can see the epicenter in the middle of those images. On the left is uh, radar backscatter after the earthquake, in the middle before the earthquake. And you can see that from the intensity uh, backscatter, we cannot actually monitor so 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 much uh, uh, we, we we don't uh, we, we, we don't use the differences between the intensity measures to um, to focus on the formations because uh, what we can see is maximally here some changes in the ice over over the lake in uh, in, in, in Mongolia but the situation is different if we use so-called phase Phase is another information that we get from Sentinel-1 um, and by itself, the, if you take a look at, the, at the, the, the image of phase, we would actually not, not be able to see, see much. That's why it's not really, uh, not really used by, uh, in, in community. But uh, if you do difference of phase images, you get something called interferogram. And by the inter uh, this interferogram is capturing changes with the sensitivity, uh, well, depending on the wavelength, but uh, let's say that sensitivity of some millimeters for, for the formations that, that could have happened during that time. And it's uh, relatively, well, it's possible <laughs> to um, recalculate these phases and wrap them so-called and generate pictures like that. This is an unwrapped interferogram recalculated into metric units. So we can see that in that place we have some, let's say 20 centimeters of deformation maximum. So this is basically what we are in two here within the Lixar system, we are generating this type of data. And we are doing it for 
actually most of tectonic and volcanic zones uh, of course on the on the land okay so this is basically the product that we generate within the Lixar system. Um, we do interferograms, coherence and unwrap interferograms. On this example, you can see a deformation at Volcano Piton de la Furnes in La Reunion. You can see that uh, by um, product called coherence, we can actually uh, identify lava flows. And now something about the alchemy within within the system. So basically what we what we do is we are um, getting the original uh, Sentinel-1 images provided by, by ESA and we kind of um, extract, okay, we extract base units of this uh, of these images called bursts. And then we uh, recompose them into units that we call frames. Frames are, let's say, 260 times 260 kilometers, more or less. It's a standard frame. And and you can see it actually in this workflow chain. We receive. We start from Central One SLC data that are stored in at SIDA archive and we are actually using a specific system to uh, to describe those data in our metadata database to process the data at the SIDA Jasmine supercomputing facility where we constantly run on some 100 parallel jobs and um, yeah, to process one image, it can take around one and a half hours within our automated processing chain. After we um, pre-process the data, we call it resampling, we can generate interferograms. We generate four interferograms in a row with each temporal epoch. Uh, this is great solution for uh, for not only observing um, the formation in interference but also doing time series analysis with some SB small baseline uh, time series uh, algorithm so we are generating the interferograms and we actually down sample them into some let's say generally useful uh, resolution to 110 meters we have some 350 terabytes of space allocated for our data and we are quite filling it fast. Now, after all these interferometric products are geocoded, we share them through various systems and interconnect with, with, with tools like, for example, Dixbus. And yeah, this is one example of the interconnected system lately developed Comet Volcano portal, where by clicking on each volcano, you can take a look on, on interferograms that are post-processed to detect the deformations automatically or providing time series where possible. Another interconnected project is the earthquake event portal, where we generate coseismic interferograms um, within 12 hours after after a significant earthquake uh, happens and actually after the, um, the the area is of course um, observed by by, by sentinel one now strong interconnected tool is Lixbus developed by 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 a colleague here in 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 leeds that has returned to, to Japan, Yumorshita. Uh, this tool is an open source Python implementation of adapted NSBus technique. So you can download the tool and use it. It automatically downloads Lixar data and 
includes atmospheric corrections were available. So basically by, by NS bus, I mean um, a time series inversion that is, um, that is more flexible to some potential gaps in, in, in a data set, uh, which is something that we are working on constantly, uh, gap filling our data. But uh, yeah, you can, you can use this tool even with that. Some example of uh, basic result from Rixpass. Um, actually, this result has been created using just standard parameters. So um, give, it, give it a try if you are interested in some particular area here. You can see an uplift at uh, Grindavik in Iceland. It's a um, little older result, but you can see that uh, since 2020, the uplifting started. And actually, <laughs> I show it because uh, today there was um, an earthquake um, directly in that place. And if you are interested in uh, in signal prior to this um, earthquake, you can actually take a look on this um, advertised volcano portal where you have more up-to-date result uh, created by the XPAS. Um, okay, now, this is more or less about the general idea what uh, what is Lixar system doing, how do we process data. Um, something up to date, let's say, some additional functionality. So what we are now in, um, yeah, perhaps I should I should introduce to the to the fact that actually interferograms are biased by different types of errors. Um, or signals, I cannot call them errors really. So we see ionospheric signal, for example, and um, we intend to uh, include ionospheric correction when, uh, when things will get more stable. Um, here is an example. Uh, if, you, if we would keep uh, phase ramps over the whole frame, we would obviously get some uh, some some errors with uh, time series uh, data, for example. Now another type of uh, signal that we that we see and that we should remove if we are into looking to deformation is the atmosphere. We are interconnected to GACOS more later, and yeah, it's it's possible to 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 remove the the basic the atm atmospheric contribution. Uh, you can see that there is some residual ramp anyway. We can actually get rid of this ramp by um, by correcting for solid air tides that uh, have some small but have some influence. And this is the result. Don't be afraid of that. Uh, red parts in blue actually, if you take a look on the scale, it's not that big difference between them. Um, yeah, uh, solid air tide is something, let's say, uh, new, newly added to the system. Um, you can see that um, actually in this particular area, uh, the, the tides are uh, varying within, let's say, 30 centimeters. And um, there are sometimes differences in space within this, let's say, 300 kilometers that actually are causing the ramp and should be should be removed. We do some work within other improvements like unwrapping. Actually, if I skip uh, detailed explanation, you can uh, take a look on the on the right part. Um, while we offer the original interferograms in relatively fine resolution, sometimes we can actually get uh, get the signal if we um, reprocess the data in some some specific way and therefore we can actually get much smoother sig deformation signal that can be used for uh, for uh, a large scale uh, motion monitoring and finally wanted to show another experimental uh, technique 
that is to study um, study azimuth delay that is happening within um, within within the satellite track and thought normally interferograms are uh, sensitive in vertical and east-west direction because they uh, fly more or less to the north but they are uh, for example right looking um, insar is not really sensitive to north and south motion however we can use um, something that uh, is uh, that that we usually uh, correct uh, from the interferograms this something is called ESD estimate and um, if you investigate the the signal of that you can actually you can actually see the north south plate motion this is some something for further works and also we could actually see some periodic signal within each uh, huge frames that is presumably ionospheric and yeah that's actually very briefly <laughs> all from from me from about, about the system and updates thank you okay great okay thank you milan for the uh, first part of this pre presentation and introducing the lixar system uh, so in the second part of uh, the presentation i will also bring some uh, updates about the lixar system i will mainly focus on the Lixar file structure, the current status of the Lixar system, some Lixar uh, modules, and some case studies in which the Lixar data have been used for obtaining the velocity field, and finally, the phase bias phenomenon. So here you can see the Lixar system file structure, uh, which shows all the products that we are generating in the, the Lixar system. Uh, starting from the top, uh, the Lixar products are categorized into 175 folders, uh, which corresponds to the Sentinel-1 175 orbits. In the next level, uh, the frames are defined. So for each frame, the main uh, Lixar outputs are stored in the interferograms, as you can see here. Uh, so we are generating the coherence image, the filtered, wrapped, and unwrapped phases. Uh, also, the, un, uh, the unfiltered wrapped phases are also being uh, stored here. Uh, we are also planning to include the unfiltered unwrapped phases soon. So apart from these uh, INSAR products, we store some useful information in the metadata folder, uh, as you can see here. Uh, in the metadata folder, we uh, store the uh, ENU files, uh, which refers to the east, north, and upward components of the line, line of sight uh, unit vector for each pixel. And uh, the unit vector information can be used for uh, projecting the ENU modeling results or, let's say, the 3D GNSS data onto the line of sight vector in order to be able to compare the compare them to the Lixar uh, results. So here I would like to explain the current status of the system. Uh, as you can see in this table, uh, as of February, 2021, uh, we have a total of uh, uh, 1,727 frames all over the world. And we have processed more than 125,000 Sentinel-1 acquisitions and generated more than 400,000 interferograms so far. Uh, among the total number of frames, we have got about uh, uh, 470 volcanic frames, which covers more than 1,000 uh, global volcanoes. Uh, about the updating policy that we follow in the Lixar system, I should say that we currently have a list of uh, about 700 frames, which are being updated on a monthly basis. And these are mainly the tectonic frames. Uh, we also have got a list of uh, 100 frames, more or less, which are being updated on a weekly basis. These are mainly the volcanic frames. And finally, we have a list of active volcanoes, 
which are received from the global uh, volcanism uh, program database three times a week. So the number of frames in this list is variable and depends on the volcanic activities. These frames are updated as early as the availability of the Sentinel-1 acquisition. And for these frames, we don't wait for the uh, precise orbits to come up. This figure shows the number of generated interferograms uh, in the Lixar system from 2016 up until the present time. And uh, in 2019, in August 2019, we had a processing push. And uh, so in that time, uh, we had a, more than 100,000 interferograms. And as you can see at the moment, we reached to 400,000 interferograms in terms of the number of interferograms in 2021. Uh, about the GACOS module, so Milan provided some slides. It was shown in several case studies actually that the GACOS corrections for uh, tropospheric actually corrections uh, usually can reduce the interferogram uh, phase standard deviation by 20 or 30 percent. And uh, the GACOS products are calculated for each Lixar frame with the same image size and the same resolution of our final uh, products. And uh, they are provided uh, both at uh, vertical and line of sight direction. This makes it very easy for the users to directly apply the corrections for their interferograms. And this is where uh, we store the GACOS products in the Lixar system. And as I said, uh, uh, it's provided in both the zenith angle and a slant range direction and uh, also in geotiff format. It is good to let you know that uh, the Lixpass is able to automatically read these corrections if the user uh, selects that option. The next module uh, that uh, in the Lixar uh, system is a quality check module, like any uh, automatic system uh, that provides services to the end users. We developed a quality check module to make sure that the interprograms are correctly generated. So you can see some examples of uh, the bad interprograms here. We developed a two-step quality check module to identify these bad interferograms. Uh, in the first step, uh, which is mainly based on using some morphological image processing techniques uh, for the identification of these artifacts, we use uh, a canny edge detection plus some line detection algorithm, uh, which is followed by some morphological operations to identify those bad interferograms. And we tested the, the algorithm over uh, many interferograms as some training samples and it provided good performance. Although we are still trying to improve the performance of this quality check. And in the second step, the normalized mean coherence and normalized unwrapped fractions are employed to form a 2D feature space in which the bad interferograms cluster could easily be identified by defining a threshold value in this space. We uh, run this uh, quality check module before storing the products to the portal. And uh, so this is the LixBAS time series algorithm, which was explained actually in the previous presentation. In summary, the LixBAS processing flow involves uh, five steps for data preparation and six steps for time series analysis. In the data preparation steps, the data are directly downloaded from the Lix portal and uh, uh, let's say the GACOS correction, making of the low coherence areas are performed in, this, uh, in these steps. In the time series part, uh, the first two steps are responsible for the quality control and loop closure check. And right after that, the SPAS algorithm is being performed and uh, LixPass is able to produce a mask based on uh, different indices and the users can apply this mask to their final results. And these steps are fully explained in these two uh, papers by Yumurishita. Uh, here you can see the LixPass uh, estimated velocities for all the Lixar frames. So uh, the velocities were only estimated on the frames for which we have had at least one year of connected network. Here I zoomed uh, all in the in the Alpine Himalayan belt. And uh, there are some line wavelengths ramps in the velocities, uh, which could be due to the ionospheric effect. 
And uh, so LexPass is able to remove these uh, effects by uh, like, so let's say fitting a, a best fit polynomial, a quadratic polynomial or a planar ramp, as you will see in my next slide. So this is also the, the, the velocities after removing this ramp. And uh, as expected, it is much more spatially homogeneous. Uh, this slide shows the coherency in a very large scale, again, for all the frames that we have got in the LixR system. And it is quite clear that areas with, uh, with, uh, with high vegetation cover are having lower coherency. And uh, so you are able to download this global coherence map uh, in both ascending and descending in these two links, which are provided at the bottom of this page. This slide shows the frames in terms of the maximum uh, connected network. Uh, as can be seen, most of the frames in the Alpine Himalayan belt have a fairly good connected network. However, uh, there are still some frames which needs to be further processed, further gap filled to have a very good uh, connect, a long connected network. And actually the availability of a long-term connected network is very important when uh, you're doing a time series analysis. So, in the LixR team, we aim at filling all the gaps in the time series, uh, especially for, our, for all uh, uh, priority zones. And this is the frame velocities again, but in the, in the, in the descending uh, orbit after uh, doing the ramp removal. Okay, so next uh, we can derive the uh, 3D large scale velocity field uh, using these frame wise velocities. Uh, we did this uh, for some case studies. In one case study, this was done by, uh, by Jonathan Weiss to study the North Anatolian fault in Turkey. Uh, we generally follow a two-step approach for this purpose. In the first step, we tie all the in-star velocities uh, to GNSS data, the available GNSS data. And this involves interpolating the, uh, all the uh, GNSS data and projecting them into the in-star line of sight and then solving for uh, the best fit plane or could be a quadratic surface to adjust the install velocities into the GNSS reference frame. Here you can see the referenced install uh, velocities, which is actually the output of the first step in both ascending and descending. Uh, for your information, in this study, more than uh, 8,000 Sentinel-1 acquisitions were processed and we generated 30,000 interferograms in 40 different uh, frames covering the whole region. So this was the first step. In the second step, uh, we can invert them together to obtain the east, west, and vertical velocities. So uh, those blue regions, as you can see in the, in, the, in, the, in the vertical velocity component are related to some uh, anthropogenic activities like water extraction. And on the left, you can see the broader scale uh, eastward movement of the Anatolian plate with reference to the Eurasian plate. So this two-step approach works well when we have a dense GPS network, such as in Turkey. However, when, uh, the, G uh, when the GNSS data are sparse, this approach is not good because the mainly the, 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 the interpolated GNSS data are not accurate in that case. So the next study area is the central Tibet. Unlike Turkey, uh, we do not have a dense GPS network here. So in order to avoid this sparse GNSS interpolation problem here, the referencing and the inversion pro process were performed in a single step. So this means that the, 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 inv the inversion process solves for both the reference frame adjustment parameters as well as the velocities of the nodes in the mesh, as you can see the mesh at the bottom of this page. So both steps are being uh, performed in, uh, simultaneously. Uh, here are the 3D velocities estimated over the mesh nodes. And uh, uh, here is the east, up, and north component of the 3D velocity calculated over the mesh nodes. And also you can see the second invariant of the strain rate. So the team and Chris uh, were mainly uh, involved in uh, obtaining this uh, huge velocity field in Tibet. Uh, the eastward motion of the central Tibet is clear in the east-west velocity component. 
uh, as you can see at the top left figure. We can also see a good fit of the uh, velocity field with the, with the, with the gen GNSS data in the bottom left plot. Uh, so if we compare this to the uh, velocity where only the GNSS data were employed, uh, as you can see here, the GNSS only velocity field is much smoother uh, as was expected. So uh, as you see in the in, as you see in this one, which is both which is using both the INSAR and GNSS, there are much more details uh, when using both uh, information uh, uh, for obtaining the velocity field. And finally, as a validation, we compare this uh, modeled velocity, which is obtained through the through the joint inversion with the observed referenced INSAR data after solving for the frame adjustment parameters only in both ascending and descending directions. And uh, this figure shows the residuals. So as you can see, the, 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 the joint inversion approach provided uh, good results here and provided a good fit both to the observed INSAR data as well as the GNSS uh, data, uh, which is uh, clear from the obtained RMS uh, residual. So these are just some uh, per preliminary results. And for much more details, you can maybe see Team Wright's uh, AGU talk this year. And in the last part of my presentation, uh, one thing that I would like to a little bit have more emphasis when using the LIXR data or any other multi-looked interferograms for doing the time series analysis is uh, to be careful about the phase bias phenomenon. This phase bias phenomenon is mainly affecting the, the short-term uh, multi-looked interferogram. So in general, uh, in the absence of the phase bias, we will have a zero phase closure. However, due to the lack of consistency, this will not happen. And uh, uh, we usually end up to a non-zero phase closure. In this example, uh, you see an 18-day interferogram. It's a, it is a, a, for a frame in Turkey in the left. And uh, these are uh, the three corresponding six tag interferograms, which are spanning exactly the same time after the 18 interferograms. So subtracting these two, we will come up to uh, this uh, residual phase, as you can see in the, in the, in the right plot. So if I just uh, uh, zoom in uh, uh, in this residual phase, you can see some spatially correlated uh, signals which are caused by the phase bias. Uh, it was observed in the, in the previous studies that uh, the variation in the, in the, in the, in the soil moistures and the multi-looking window or the change in the water content of vegetation or uh, the vegetation growth you know, even uh, may lead to such phase inconsistencies. And as I said, this phenomenon uh, is more uh, visible uh, and stronger in the, in the, in the short-term interprograms rather than the long one. Uh, here I'm just showing that uh, even though the amount of the phase bias is not significant in each individual interferogram, its accumulation to the time can, can, can highly affect the final estimated deformation. And this is quite clear in this animation and shows uh, how this phase bias is being accumulated in time. So 12 day here is a 12 day interferogram and uh, we subtract this from the corresponding two uh, six day interferograms. And if we accumulate this, you could see in the beginning, it's very, uh, very small, but by accumulating in time, the contribution of this phase is increasing, especially uh, it has some uh, special correlation. In some places it is higher, in some places it is lower. And uh, if you assume that the, the long-term interferograms such as for example, a two months interferogram, the 60 day interferogram are minimally affected by the phase bias, then you can see how the shorter interferograms are more affected by the bias. And, uh, and uh, as we increase the temporal baseline, the interferograms uh, are less affected by the, by, the, by the phase bias. So in this figure, the, the 60 minus six is the 60 day interferogram minus six day interferogram. And the, the highest amount of bias is observed in the, in the, in the 60 minus six uh, day bias. So the mitigation strategies uh, are either trying to uh, correct 
the interferogram is using an estimated uh, moisture induced phase, which is uh, proposed by Francesco Dizan and some other people. Or, uh, but it, it would be a bit challenging because we, we really don't know the exact cause of this. It could be due to soil moisture variation to the vegetation growth and some other uh, phenomenon or the phase linking approaches could be employed. So these phase linking methods employs the full coherence or full covariance metrics as their input, such as EMI method or the CSAR approach or the SQUESAR approach, some examples of the phase linking. Here in Comet also, we are also working on this uh, empirical, we are looking for an empirical solution actually to, for, to solve this uh, uh, problem. And we have obtained some promising preliminary results and I don't want to go through the details of the algorithm. I just show you some uh, preliminary results here. Uh, here, I just show you the six day velocity before and after uh, correction. And uh, we want to compare this with the phase linking Caesar algorithm, as you can see at the, at, the, at, the, at the right side. So comparing the six day velocity with the Caesar velocities. Uh, so these two are the, the difference between the six day uh, velocity with the Caesar velocity and the right one is the six day corrected velocity and the Caesar velocity. So comparing these two, you can see that we have had a very good improvement after using the corrected interferograms for velocity estimation. And here we can uh, see the corresponding histograms. The left is the histogram for the Caesar minus the six day velocity. And the right shows the difference between the corrected uh, when, using the, when using the corrected uh, interferograms. So it is clear that uh, the bias in the velocity, which can be seen in the left plot is significantly removed after the correction. So the good news is that when you add the, the longer interferograms such as 12 or 18 or 24 days to your SVAS network, the impact of such a phenomenon would uh, definitely decrease this. And in my last slide, uh, here are some tasks that are, we are trying to accomplish for the future. Uh, we aim at completing all the frames in the Alpha Himalayan belt and East African rift, uh, as well as the volcanic priority frames. And uh, we try to fill all the gaps in the, time, in, the, in the time series for all these frames in the near future. And uh, we will provide the GACOS corrections for all these frames. We already started providing the GACOS corrections, but it is not complete. So we try to provide this uh, GACOS corrections for all uh, those frames. And also correcting for the inospheric induced long wavelength waste ramps as Milan showed. Uh, at least for some maybe selected areas is uh, one of our objective for the future. We are working on providing the phase bias correction terms. And uh, as I already showed, uh, how will we obtain the velocity fields in the, in the North Anatolian fault and the central Tibet. We aim at generating this for uh, some other tectonic zones such as the Caucasus, the Zagros, Pamir and some other um, tectonic zones. And uh, that is it as my presentation. Thank you. So um, let's dig into these questions. Um, so, uh, it, so I'm going to go from the chat first, and we might go back and forth. Um, so Jan Akbar uh, Pamungus has asked, I would like to ask the importance of performing atmospheric phase screen APS analysis to remove the phase from the atmosphere, especially for working with C band. The signal delay issue due to water vapor water vapor contents in the troposphere would affect the accuracy, since it will contaminate the deformation phase signal that we're measuring. Um, and. Also, if it's possible, could you explain about a bit about scientific basics of how to perform such an analysis to get more precise and reliable INSAR products? Um, so I think the second part of that is about the tropospheric and atmospheric correction. Oh, okay. I can perhaps comment a little bit. Um, yes, definitely. Um, Jan Akbar is uh, right, the uh, atmospheric effects um, can be, um, uh, can reduce the quality of the signal of deformation um, or even can, can exchange um, 
uh, if you interpret such such signal as, 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 as the formation. However, if you do some time series analysis, um, you may also actually remove that uh, that atmospheric phase screen by by, by that. It's uh, uh, we we use CACOS corrections that are based on ECMWF model plus maybe GNSS if uh, available. It's not it's not really something that you would like to uh, 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 analyze yourself. I think, yeah. Okay, thanks, Milan. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go. We're gonna go through the, the chat and the open questions in the Q and A because we have a lot of questions. So, the ones that have been answered in the Q and A, um, we're going to uh, we won't ask live just because we have a lot of them. But if anybody who had a question answered would like to ask a follow up or get more clarification, feel free to just post another question or the same. Um, just copy paste the same question with, you know whatever modifiers back into the Q&A or the chat and we'll get to it. So a second question is from uh, Russell Fetzi. Uh, in the, uh, the SBAS method, part of the results sometimes can appear as no data. How can this challenge be solved? For example, um, when there's a no data problem, we can't calculate land, uh, the width of land subsidence in the region, you know, as one of many cases where that would cause a problem. Um, yeah. Is that, a, is that an issue in LixPass? Uh, it is not an issue at, uh, actually. So, uh, so we usually um, apply a threshold over the, co uh, over the average coherence when we, are, when we want to generate the final results. So this is uh, very uh, common when doing the SPAS algorithm. So we usually apply a threshold uh, over the coherence. So those uh, parts which are no data actually are those areas which are left uh, below the threshold. And that's why we don't have much information about that. So this could be the main reason, I think. Okay. Um, so an, uh, an, an anonymous attendee asked, the vertical and east-west movement related with the LANA site can be modeled just with one orbit, ascending or descending, or does it always take necessarily both? Okay, I think, if we are doing yeah, this yeah. ping pong, uh, well, yeah, if you have the answer. <laughs> well, yeah, that'll go ahead, Mila. That, that, that will depend on whether you have GPS or GNSS to some extent. But anyway, yeah, go ahead, guys. Well, actually, you can you can decompose to um, yeah vertical and east west if you have both ascending and descending orbits, right? Um, uh, uh, you would miss the north and south component in such inversion because the uh, inside is not really sensitive to north south south motion. So um, normally in practice, people just neglect that part. For example, to yeah to go to, to get only horizontal and vertical. Um, I think that you you can actually. <laughs> You, you, you can uh, use just simple recalculation using ratio cosinus incidence angle to get vertical from uh, uh, by neglecting is the east west component uh, but this is not really uh, not really precise way of doing that so yeah I, I agree that uh, you would need ascending and descending orbits to do that do that decomposition yeah. Um, so, um, Omid Memarian Sokabi has asked, how can the, yeah, how can the fault be determined to be right lateral or left lateral from Minsar? I think this is, uh, Chris expert is, I think, but well, yeah, so it, yeah, yeah it, so you can... if you're looking at a long of sight, uh, interferogram and you see part of it going positive, part of it going negative, um, you know, the line of sight, so you can figure out, all right, this part went further from a satellite direction that, that part got pulled closer to the satellite. Um, and that, that should tell you the, the rake. Um, and as, as, we're, uh, as Milan was mentioning in the previous point, that might only tell you a limited a, 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 the, a component of the slip vector. Um, hopefully you'll be able to restore most of the 3D uh, rake along the fault, but um, it's not always easy to do. Um, so yeah, sorry, I didn't, if you guys want to, Add anything? No, that's fine. I think. Um, okay, so uh, Syed Mohammed Javad Mirzadeh has asked, 
by this final spatial resolution of the Lixar system, 100 meters, have you ever checked the possibility of also seasonal signals, elastic behavior of displacements? Uh, well, uh, is, it, is it about the scale of deformation, probably? Um, what, what type of uh, deformation would be, would be in, uh, in, in account? Um, I mean, okay, we, we have data 100 meters times 100 meters, but if we related them in time and in, in the space, uh, we, we should capture some uh, both linear and periodic motion. And yeah, it's, uh, you can actually use Ligspass and it would evaluate also periodic motion if there are some annual, uh, annual periods, yeah. Yeah, it does fit a sinusoid. Or, or an oscillation as well, if you want. Um, Roland Bergman has asked, does GACOS now include hourly atmosphere model and GPS zenith delay info? Uh, I think because it is based on ECMWF actually. So uh, if I'm not mistaken, ECMWF is uh, providing the correction uh, every four hours. So it is not hourly, I guess. So based on the based on the, the temporal resolution of the ECMWF, we can provide the the the, the related GACOS uh, data. And for the uh, GPS, as far as I know from the GACOS, for those areas that the GP the GNSS network are available, it is being taken into account. But for I, I think for most of the cases, it is only based on the ECMWF and not GPS. Okay. Um. Omid Memarian Sarkabi has asked, what is the ultimate accuracy of INSAR in a 3D velocity study? In GNSS, you need sub-millimeter accuracy for tectonic plate studies. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, you know, the, the phase bias probably f affects that, I guess. Yeah, there are many parameters actually affecting the final uh, accuracy. So if you could, uh, uh, let's say, do all the necessary corrections, let's say the, 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 the tropospheric correction, the ionospheric correction, and uh, also try to include as much as the long interferogram as we can to, uh, to uh, avoid the phase bias, yes, it is possible to, to reach uh, the, the, the millimetric accuracies within the, the final velocity uh, field. But as I said, it really depends on where you are processing. In some areas, uh, it is uh, much more complicated because of the atmospheric effects. In some areas, maybe the coherence is very high. The atmosphere is not that significant. So it is much easier to achieve this uh, accuracy. Yeah. So Jan Akbar Pumungas has asked, um, I would like to ask the importance, this is in the q and I'd like to ask the importance of performing, oh, sorry, did we already? No, yeah, sorry, we already got to that. Um, uh, okay. Uh, uh, Fahime Salehi has asked, can, can Lixbass be used for land subsidence deformation or I guess studying that? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so if the, if the uh, I mean, the general answer is yes, as Milan said, so if, uh, the, the case study is uh, like in an urban area and uh, the user is interested to, the, to study the, the subsidence over some maybe special infrastructure, then maybe the, 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 the uh, Lixar products would not be that efficient. But generally, if you, are, if you want to study the land subsidence in the agricultural area and for which the, the, the 100 meter resolution is fine, then I think, yes, uh, it is uh, possible to use this for uh, studying the land subsidence. Awesome. Um, Alejandro Vasquez has asked, in which cases, is, this is in the QA, is, in which cases is it advisable to work with a combination of, oh, the following four SAR images and which cases with the preceding four? Um, so I guess, as far as uh, yeah, how to do the three, four, five combination, and do you want to go? Do you, do you slide it forwards uh, from the starting date, or do you take the middle or the preceding four? 
I still don't really understand the question, perhaps. But um, yeah, for for every image, for every every epoch that we have, like acquisition date, um, we we do. Uh, okay, let's say for preceding uh, con uh, connections, so for for interferograms before. But uh, if you if you take a look in, in in time when there is another epoch, it would of course generate also the, the the previous combination. So for for each epoch, you would have four combinations before and after. If it if this answers the question. Yeah, I guess a case where you'd want to use like the preceding four, for example, would be if you have the, the last interferogram before a really snowy period or something like that, um, where the next four are just, they're, they're far in the future. So um, possibly. Okay, so an, autonom uh, an anonymous attendee has asked, where could we refer to get more phase bias reduction approaches to solve temporal decorrelation? Uh, there have been uh, several studies. I just showed you uh, some phase linking approaches in my slides. So this is a really hot topic. And uh, if you just search for the phase linking approaches, you can find many different approaches the, which uh, actually are really good methods for uh, removing this. In uh, 2020, there was a paper by Homa Ansari who uh, studied uh, this phenomenon and how this will affect the final uh, time series velocity. So I will, uh, I suggest you to go through that paper. This is a very good paper and have a good uh, literature review and reviewing many different uh, related studies for this. So maybe that would be a good uh, start if you want to have more knowledge about the, this effect and uh, how uh, it can be mitigated. Okay, thanks. Um... So an uh, anonymous attendee has asked, which is the best way to calculate? I, I think they just uh, missed what you're saying, Yasser, about which is the best way to calibrate the information if the not sufficient GNSS are available? I guess if it's just sparse. Yeah, yeah. This is actually a big challenge if we don't, if we don't have a dense uh, GPS network. So we need this GPS network for tying the, uh, the, the in-star velocities to GPS. So when we don't have enough uh, GPS network, then the, we would have some uh, issues in the in the in the tying of the velocities to the uh, to the GPS. So in, uh, we had a case study in central Tibet, and as I just showed you, in that uh, case study, uh, instead of doing this in two separate steps, I mean the tying uh, the tying uh, step as well as the inversion step, we followed both steps at the same time. So uh, by the inversion, I mean the uh, obtaining the velocity, the 3D velocities over the mesh points. So uh, if you uh, if you if you want to uh, uh, follow this uh, two-step approach, this would provide better results comparing to uh, like let's say uh, doing this in a two different steps. Cool. So Amir um, Abulgazem has asked, do you have any preference for the GNSS sites to tie? Imagining, imagine you are establishing a GNSS network before imaging a tectonically deforming area. Where do you prefer to have your sites? Do you want to have them at locations of larger deformation rate or at relatively stable locations? Um, is, that, is it only enough to be in the imaging field, being at the center of the study area? Uh, yeah, I think the availability of the uh, the GNSS to have a good coverage of the GNSS data is very important when you are studying the uh, tectonic region. So if uh, for some areas there is a gap, we definitely have some issues for uh, for tying uh, the velocities of that region to the GPS. So it is very important to have a very good coverage, to have very good consistent coverage all over the uh, uh, study area that you want to uh, investigate. Yeah, and just to follow up with on, on that, um, the, the more stable the rock uh, that the GNSS site is on, the better. So oftentimes they'll be on rock outcrops. Um, it's, it's much harder to get a good signal if they're in, for example, a, a, a marshy setting or something like that, um, or one with a lot of seasonal. So, um, okay, so... Uh, Muzad Shah has asked, snafu phase unwrapping algorithm has some cross-compatibility issues, this is in the Q&A. 
Granted, is it a good? It is a good phase unwrapper, but all the interest is lost when someone is stuck on the configuration itself. Any, um, any, any suggestions? So that's about, I guess, cro cross platform and getting Snafu to work. Yeah, I think uh, that there is there is a lot of a um, um, lot of good open source tools that are working on Linux. So I'm afraid that if some user is um, uh, able to Windows, he should perhaps um, maybe look into some more commercial products. As um, uh, Snafu is of course not the only unwrapper, but I I can't remember any any other. Gamma has some unwrapper that we don't use actually because um, we realize that Snafu gives us better results. But um, yeah, commercial commercial software would be would be the the uh, set answer. Yeah, or Linux. Yeah. Um, okay. In the questions or in sorry in the chat, Enrique uh, sorry Enrique Antonio F uh, Fernandez Torres has asked. Hi, is it possible to use S1 SBAS, Sentinel 1 SBAS, to study deformation in civil infrastructure? Yeah, I think it is possible. Yeah, but uh, maybe for the infrastructure, the, the, the use of the PS INSAR would provide better yeah. results. Because when you're when we are using a SPAS, then we have some kind of averaging, then this averaging maybe could cause some inconsistencies in some areas. So maybe for urban regions, uh, the best method would be the PS INSAR rather than this SPAS. Actually, you may also use SPAS in for, for infrastructure monitoring, but I think you would better start with uh, high resolution data. We are downsampling the data, so it's not really the best for, uh, for it's maybe even not possible to, to uh, monitor infrastructure using Dixar data because of course in resolution. Uh, right. But SPAS should be possible for infrastructure monitoring. So give it a try with, for example, the XPAS use it for, um, uh, for, for some high resolution data that you would process by some other tools like GMT SAR. Yeah. Yeah. So in the Q&A, we get a couple more questions. Tohid uh, Nozad Khalil has asked, if your reference frame for all data is Eurasia, how do you explain the relative velocity in Europe? So, yeah, I think we need to take a reference uh, frame. It could be Eurasia, it could be Anatolia or anywhere. So every velocity is uh, calculated with reference to that frame. So uh, I didn't quite understand the question. So this- I think, yeah, I think the question is Europe is kind of going to be very stable and going to be almost a zero zone if you're comparing it to Eurasia because it's part of stable Eurasia. So um, I guess, uh, maybe you would want to use a different uh, reference, a different reference frame for studying. Well, it depends on, I guess, what you're looking at. If you're looking at the Alps um, and convergence, or um, if you're looking at the um, extension of Italy, maybe you want to use some sort of zero reference frame. I don't mean to jump in here. Yeah, uh, that, that's, that's completely right. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay. Wouldn't, wouldn't some um, new European reference system help to... Yeah, it could also. So Alejandro Vasquez has asked, what, yeah, what is the final size of a pixel after the multi-looking? How do you find the number of range and azimuth looks? I would prefer seeing that question actually. Is it in, in chat or question? In, in the, the Q&A. So yeah, how many range and azimuth multi-looks? Is it, is it 20 and four? Yes, uh, it is 20 and four, but we also do a downsampling step. Yeah. So actually it would be something like 40 to eight okay. in the end. Um, and then the pixel size is, yeah, so a hundred meters, right? Yeah. Um, sorry, so our, uh, our last question unanswered at this point is from um, Hector Morapais. 
Uh, I would like to know about the advantage of using corner reflectors for subsidence studies using NSAR. This is a great idea, but again, uh, you would need to go outside to Lixar because we, we, we give the data that are uh, really, really downsampled. But um, give it a go. I think Sentinel-1 would be also great for infrastructure monitoring with the coronal reflector if you orient it properly, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, make sure there's no, yeah. Okay, I think that is it for the questions. Um, oh, sorry, so an, an anonymous attendee has asked, how does SBAS deal with temporal decorrelation for mangrove and agriculture areas uh, to, really, to retrieve surface deformation with Sentinel-1? Uh, so the temporal decorrelation uh, effect is usually in SPAS by uh, doing the averaging actually, or by multi-looking and filtering, we try to uh, provide a better uh, coherence and uh, let's say compensate this uh, temporal uh, decorrelation, but uh, it, is, it is difficult to um, discriminate between, let's say, the mangrove, which areas are the mangroves and the agricultural areas and so on. So for, I mean, for those areas, for all the areas, this is what we are usually uh, following to achieve this. Well, I, I thought you would say something about the phase bias, Yasir, actually. Yeah, this is also important, yeah, but I, I don't want to complicate things here. So yeah, the phase bias is also, uh, would be an uh, uh, important issue, especially in the agriculture areas, because in the agriculture areas, we have a very, uh, the, the agriculture growth is happening maybe in a short term, but this is not happening in mangroves or in the forest areas. So this, uh, the phase bias is more evident in the agricultural areas rather than the forest areas. Right, because we, yeah, the data that you need are the, are the biased ones, I guess. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, I can also mention that we we, we tried to uh, find some signal in uh, decorrelated zones, which means like in, in, in some type of jungles. Uh, mangroves are complicated, really. The signal is uh, getting lost. But if you are searching for some um, some long wave signal, like um, co-seismic signal, for example, then you may be lucky after some really strong multi-looking um uh, for for this you probably cannot start with lixar data either you can check if it's uh, if it's visible there or not if it's something of a particular interest you can uh, con contact us and uh, we will gladly um, take a look and uh, and give some answer but uh, for mangroves i think that you would be more lucky with some l band data which means uh, yeah, Alos to Saucom in future NISAR uh, or, or some, some, some other in future, but uh, yeah, depending on what you are uh, looking to in, uh, in mangroves. Okay, um, so uh, if anybody has any other questions, feel free to email uh, Yasser, Milan, or any of us um, and make sure to get to you. Um, and thanks everybody um, for attending. Thanks so much, Milan and Yasser, for taking the time to present and um, uh, and uh, showing us how this all works. Um, so I think we'll stop there. Um, and yeah, thanks everybody again. Our next webinar, uh, at least right now, will be on March seventeenth, um, and we'll keep you updated with ones that we add to our schedule. <laughs>